let me get the distance right here. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about angular momentum. So just like we've been talking about with all these other things, um, there are angular versions of just about everything we have linearly. So the base information that we have, momentum is mass times velocity. And we used to solve some problems like this. Before two objects come together, let's say it's completely inelastic and they stick together. And you have a mass of this one, and you have a velocity of each one, and we had to pick a positive direction. And you get a total momentum. And we know the total momentum after is the same, but we know the mass of this is the mass of each of these added together. Let me just pretend they're the same mass. And then we can take the momentum, divide by the mass, and get the new velocity. Okay, so that's how we use conservation of momentum. Angular momentum, uh, if you've got a bicycle wheel spinning, right, you give it a spin if it's, uh, you know, upside down bicycle, and you give it a spin, it keeps spinning and spinning. It'll slow down when there's uh, force on it, and in fact, when there's a torque on it. And so that how hard it is to stop, that's your angular momentum. That's how much momentum it has for spinning. And just like P equals MV, how hard it is to stop or start, this is inertia, right? Mass is how hard it is to get something to change its motion. Uh, and the velocity, we have this, which is rotational inertia. How easy it is to get it to change its rotational motion times omega, its ang angular speed. Okay, and it gets can get really, really complicated, but of course I'm not going to do that to you. But let's let's use this analogy here. Just like we had two objects before and one after, we could have two objects before and one after here. Okay, and what I've got is a carousel here, and it's a pretty lousy carousel. And it's got a certain rotational inertia that is actually based on a formula that we could use. I just plugged in some numbers, and this is on a playground, and a kid's going to run and jump on the carousel. And it starts at rest. It's not rotating. So it has no angular momentum. I times omega is zero. A kid is going to run and jump on it. And to show you how that works, I kind of got to pull this up. <clears throat> a person can have an angular, excuse me, a rotational inertia uh, relative to some rotating point. And the way that works is like this. If this kid runs, 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 let me get it down here, runs, 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 and jumps right towards the middle of the thing, it was not going to spin. If he jumps over here, it's going to spin a little bit. If he jumps over here, it's going to spin a lot. And so the direction he's running, where he's going to go, really affects how this is going to rotate. And the way we take that into account is by the rotational inertia. And again, you don't, know how, you don't have to know how to do rotational inertia. If I'm going to ask you a problem, I'm going to give you this number. So if we have his rotational inertia, because he's not running directly at there, he's running at some point on the side of the, of the merry-go-round or the carousel. So he's going to run and he's going to jump on there and cause them both to move. So before, his rotational inertia is 160 kilogram meters squared. I left the units out. And um, his omega, which is really just, remember, um, velocity divided by r, so how fast he's going divided by how fast, how far away from the center he's going to hit is 5 meters per second. So pretend I just gave you these numbers. Boom, 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 boom. 160 times 5 is 800. 200 times 0 is 0. The total momentum is 800. So you just really figure out the momentum for one object, figure out the momentum for the other object, and add them together. Well, we know that if there's no, remember on these ones we used to talk about if there's no net external force. Here, if there's no net external torque, if there's no friction or nobody else is pushing this thing, then L total prime, the new system angular momentum is 800. And so, and uh, I'm not even going to worry about the units on this. Don't you worry either. 800. 800 equals I of the system times the omega of the system. And we do 800 divided by 360. And we get an angular momentum of 
uh, sorry, radians per second. I don't know why I have meters per second there. Radians per second. So it's going to be actually rotating less. This guy's going to slow down. The thing is going to speed up. And the together, they're going to go at 2.2 radians per second. So it really looks almost exactly the same. We do the total before and the total after. But there's another thing that's really interesting about angular momentum. If I just had a ball rolling or a block sliding, let's do that instead. There's a hockey puck moving this way. Okay, and it has a certain P equals MV. Well, if there's no net external force on it, it's going to have the exact same momentum after, so it's going to have the exact same velocity, V prime is equal to V. That's really dull. So for linear momentum, the before and after, we're always doing two objects. Because one object's really, really silly. You don't change your mass, so you're not going to change your velocity. Rotational inertia, though, some really interesting stuff happens. And that has to do with, um, for example, an ice skater. An ice skater has their arms out. That's the worst ice skater I can think of. Ice skater is spinning and has their arms out. And remember, here's the axis of rotation. When there's a lot of mass away from the center, it's a bigger rotational inertia. If they pull their arms in like that, they've got a smaller rotational inertia. And remember that the angular momentum, which is I times omega, has to be equal to the angular momentum after all, called I prime omega prime. In linear stuff, you can't change your mass, so the velocity doesn't change. But in angular stuff, you can. If this gets smaller, this gets bigger. Another way of writing it is omega prime equals I omega over I prime. So if you pull your arms in, you have a smaller rotational inertia. So you're, you're multiplying the previous omega times something that's bigger than 1, and you get a uh, bigger omega prime. Let me show you what that looks like on... Uh, a diving board. I hope this will work. Let me let me get this going here. Um, here's a person. I'm gonna have to redo that. Let me get the camera right. I don't want you to get busy. Okay, so let's get that here. Okay, so here's a person that is an Olympic diver. Pull back a little bit, and he's gonna. Do a platform dive and I've got it on slow motion and what he does there is he's giving the normal force here is giving him a torque so it's increasing his angular momentum okay so now he's got some angular momentum because he's pushed off from the platform if you look he's really long his center of rotation is going to be something like this he's going to rotate this way so He's very long. He's have big I, very big um, rotational inertia. When he pulls in, he goes a lot faster. He has a smaller rotational inertia because most of his mass is close to the point of rotation. So he rotates faster. His omega increased. And that'll continue. He doesn't change, doesn't change until finally at the end, he wants to go in the water. He increases his rotational inertia, uh, which slows his spin. So what happened there is, if I can find my camera, there it is. So what happens there is, oh, that's going to be way out of focus. There we go, is when he's doing this. I is very big. Omega is not very big. Then he curls up. Oh man, I don't know that I can draw a person all curled up. How's that? Okay, that's better. Okay, and here's his point of rotation. So there's a whole lot of mass far away, big I. Here, all the mass is very close to the point of rotation. So he has a little I. And so L equals L prime. 
i times a little omega equals little i times a big omega. So smaller rotational inertia, bigger angular velocity. And you see this with divers, you see it with uh, gymnasts, you see it with, um, with skaters, ice skaters. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about, and this is really outside of what we can get into, but I want to talk about why when you ride on a bike, here's a wheel, here's a tire. Let me make it kind of two-dimensional there. Okay, so there's a bike wheel, right? It turns out we've been really step uh, sidestepping this whole concept of vectors it's because it's really hard. Um, but if this wheel is rolling, so it's rotating this way, the way we do the vectors, a vector has to be a straight line. And it's a thing called the right-hand rule. And I'm not, you don't have to worry about this, but this is the direction of the angular vector. You curl your fingers in the direction of the rotation, your thumb points the direction of the vector. Well, if momentum is conserved, that means that this vector wants to stay in that same direction. So if you just top on a bike in omega zero, there's no angular momentum, you fall over. But when you get it spinning, that vector wants to stay the same, which is a really cool phenomenon. And that's why you can ride your bike with no hands as long as you're going fast enough. But then as you slow down and stop, you can't stay upright. Uh, it's because that vector direction stays the same. 